Welcome to season three of ABC DEI. Thank you for staying with us up until now. Today, we're starting uh, our new season on a different note. We are going to dive a little bit deeper into some of the topics that we explored in the first two seasons. We've had the benefit of the expertise of incredible individuals who are at the forefront of conversations around uh, inclusion and equity and calling out and calling in when those aren't happening. So today we're gonna to be focusing uh, on one aspect of um, the discrimination and DEI issues we've uh, talked about so far. Susan, do you wanna set us up for what it is? Yeah, uh, and I think, you know what, um, in, in 2020, the the senseless murder of George Floyd was was a sort of a catalyst for a global recognition. It's not that people didn't know, but there was always a but this, but that. Something's always more important. Um, this is not such a big problem. But then watching someone be murdered with a knee on his throat for eight and a half minutes kind of did it for the for the majority of humans. So um, I think. This year that has come after that has had a lot of performative, a lot of tokenism, a lot of denial and self-indulgent apologies. But um, in the end, while it's the needle's moving, but how do you keep that going? And we had three specific um, experts in their field who came in to chat with us. One was Leo Johnson, who um, spoke about who you're serving, whether it's it's the people with the money or the people with the needs. And I think that um, the juxtaposition of those two and how do you make sense of it? Then we had Gail Strawn, who spoke about the, the meritocracy myth. And we dug deep into the details of that. Um, and last but not least, we had Shahara Downing, who spoke about the language of racism. You know, what, what is, how does it translate into, she's a, she's a marketer and communicator, and how does that translate into what we're saying versus what we're doing? Um, and again, that performative nature. So um, have a listen to these, uh, I think a deeper, lived experience from the lens of people who can really speak to these topics will help sort of organize some of the actions that you can take like right away and prioritize. Welcome to ABC DEI, a podcast that explores topics of diversity, equity, and inclusion through stories of distinct and powerful lived experiences. If you are tired of the preaching, shaming, and theory about why inclusion matters and just want to create change already, then you're in the right place. Join us as we unlearn bias one alphabet at a time. My name is Susan Diaz. And I'm Rohini Mukherjee. We're back again this week to talk some more with um, a, a very awesome guest that we have. I'll let uh, Rohini set her up in, in a minute, but we're going to dive deep into some subjects really close to our hearts here. So Rohini, who do we have? So I'm very excited to introduce Gail Strawn. Um, Gail is, um, has really become, you know, she's an inspirational um, friend and ally, and we've um, really crossed paths so much in the last few months. Um, so I'm very, very excited uh, to be um, talking to her today. Most recently, um, she is uh, the co-founder of the first ever national summit on um, anti-racism in PR. So Gail, welcome. Thank you for having me, Rohini. And absolutely, we've definitely crossed paths a few a few many times over the past few weeks. Yeah. And now uh, I've been introduced to Susan Diaz. So we're, we're, we're just taking over. BIPOC is uh, coming up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, love it. Um, so Gail, introduce yourselves uh, to to our guests and listeners a little bit. Tell us about your work um, and and some of the stuff that drives it. So last summer, with the awakening of dialogue around the world with the killing of George Floyd, um, was a lot of was sort of the the impetus for a lot of change that was taking place with specifically Black Lives Matter. But my journey in this dialogue of race and anti-racism and wokeness began when I was in high school and my high school law teacher was an African-American woman, the first person of color I'd ever been introduced to in the city of Toronto as an educator. 
And in high school, I learned about Brown versus Board of Education and um, Plessy versus Ferguson and, you know, the African-American sort of um, plight of civil rights. And some of, from a legal perspective, some of the laws that helped to feed into the, the civil rights changes that took place in the U.S., and I learned about Malcolm X and sort of his plight in the Nation of Islam and then coming into um, his philosophy thereafter as he as he matured through it and became El Haj Malik El Shabazz. I was overwhelmed with interest and still wondered why. Why is our society created this way? This was Gail 1990. Um, why is our society structured this way? Going into university at York, I studied Latin American Caribbean studies and political science. What job would I get thereafter? <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought I was going into law, but, um, and I thought, okay, this is a good baseline. So, but, but it was also my curiosity because why is the world structured the way it is? Why are people from India having these like these 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 Spanish sounding names. Wahoo how come you know the house for Mr. Biswath, how come he's in, in in Guyana? Where did this structure of hierarchy come from in society? So I just wondered like how come my mom's Guyanese friend looks like a white man? Like I don't get it. So it was all these why 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 questions that brought me to this path. And by last summer I was fed up. I was angry, I was emotional, I was upset. And I said, it's time for us to start talking about racism straight up because all of these socioeconomic issues are layered in race. And we talk about inclusion and diversity, but we never talk about race. So we need to start talking about race. That's one of the power structures. Yeah. And I mean, certainly I know in Canada, we've we've commiserated about this. We somehow cling on to this bare minimum, like it's not as bad as in America or it's not as bad here or, you know, we don't have this sort of overt um, racism that's, you know, in your face all the time for for many BIPOC who are in the professional industry. But that's not enough, is it? That is never enough. And just, you know, <laughs> I always say it like this. I don't compare cancers. It's all bad. And just because someone's getting dragged out of their car and, you know, being held at gunpoint and then eventually because of some circumstance that's created, it ends up dead, doesn't mean that you are better, your society is worse and we are better. Mm -hmm. Canada had over 200 years of slavery. Canada has had internships of Italian, Chinese, mm -hmm. um, Canada has used uh, the colored class as labor. Canada is on land that didn't belong to us. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, what it was our federal schools, uh, federal um, residential, schools. residential schools that were just closed in 1996, federal. So that was the awakening for me at the summit. I thought, okay, all of the residential schools are closed. No, just the federal was closed in 1996. So. We think we've evolved into this better place, but I always also remind people, I am in Canada because I came here in 1975 because the US, because Canada allowed immigrants to come outside of now the labor program. So the, those that, the wave of the brain drain of the Caribbean that came in the 60s was because Canada wanted to be a part of the United Nations. There's a reason for us coming in, but just for labor. And then thereafter, we were permitted to come in, but still not permitted to, you know, have the jobs that we were, that we, teacher for teacher, not from the Caribbean to, the, to Canada, not from India to Canada, not from Asia to Canada. It was, you're here for labor, for the labor that has now moved forward, because you look at the wave of who are the nannies and who, you know, how has that changed in terms of across BIPOC? So that's Canada's history, and it, it's not better. It's it's still racist. <laughs> you know, I like to say, Gail, that um, somewhere along the way, the word racist or or someone assuming that you are saying that to them has become a worse thing than the actual act of being a racist. <laughs> well, 
it, and wow. it's unfortunate because as long as you're in that space of, I don't want to hear about it because I'm uncomfortable with the wording, um, there's going to be no learning. And um, and I wanted to like delve a little bit deeper into what you're seeing in the, in how is this manifesting itself across the workplace uh, right now? I mean, people look at you a little bit like, yes, that sounds like a lot of problem, but that also sounds like it's over. It's not over. Tell us why. Systemic racism, the, the, the social construct of race was designed to be complicated. It has to, it has to evolve from blatant, I am going to take your body and put you in a field and make you work. I am, it had to change from, I am going to come and take your land and take things away from you and, and you know, walk down the street with my cow and, and, and farm my own land or farm the land that used to be yours. It, it doesn't, it can't look like that anymore. So it's evolved, um, you know, never mind the FBI and all the conversation that's come out that people have seen and investigated. We've heard the tapes of people saying, well, we can't just, you know, say the N word anymore. So let's use different dog whistle, dog whistle terminology that really has race um, and racist policies, procedures, and processes layered underneath. An example, Queen's University. It's in the news, so it's not anything that I'm suggesting. Um, but I always wondered, I mean, I was accepted to all the universities that I applied for. I specifically went to York because I saw students who looked like me. I didn't go to Queens. I didn't go to Western. I didn't go to McGill because there was definitely a conversation of campus representation that I was concerned about. That was in 1992. It's still the same. My daughter specifically didn't go to any of those universities I named because she was concerned about campus representation. So, and now thereafter, we see what Queens has uncovered in terms of um, having policies that specifically held back black students from applying to medical school. So it, it's there. Um, it's not as blatant. It's not saying I will not be hiring anyone who is of darker skin than me. <laughs> But you see it in the way people are interviewed. You see it in the reasons why you didn't make the cut. You see it in the reasons why we don't pull up the middle. You see it in the reasons why across the board, across Canada, most everyone is saying the same thing. We're diverse, but we have an inclusion problem. We're diverse in the entry level and beginning level and maybe, maybe kind of in the middle level of our workforce, but we don't see it near the top. Why? Why is everyone having a frozen middle problem? And then, you know, when you talk about entrepreneurs, yes, that's that's not the world I come from, but there is a challenge with funding. The, um, the Black Professionals in Technology organization, BBTN, two years ago had their, for their inaugural summit, and they specifically brought in conversation about how do we get funding as a business? How do we you know, how do we get seed money to start up? How do we, you know, go public? How do we, how do we sort of, we have our little businesses, but how do we now build them, stretch them? You know, we're seeing more board and funding opportunities for those reasons. So a lot more, pe a, lot, pe a lot of people are looking at all of these systemic barriers that have been pulling um, BIPOC away from opportunities to start up an organization, build an organization, or grow as an employee in an organization to the top ranks. I'm really excited to uh, introduce our guest. Um, I've had the um, chance to hear him speak and be very inspired. Um, Leo Napolo Johnson is an internationally acclaimed human rights activist social entrepreneur, and inspirational speaker. As the founder and executive director of global charitable organization Empowerment Squared, he has assisted over 2,000 newcomer youth and families with settling in Canada. 
and is opening the groundbreaking Liberian Learning Center, which will house the first and only public library in the post-war Liberia. Leo is a United Nations Fellow for the International Decade for People of African Descent, and he's globally renowned for his leadership accomplishments. Um, something that Leo recently said that struck a chord and I think will really set the tone for this discussion is he said, racism isn't a political issue, it's a humanitarian disaster, and it's orchestrated by fellow humans. So, Leo, welcome to ABC DEI. Thank you so much for having me, um, um, Rohini, this afternoon. Um, I'm honored to be here. I mean, we often talk about these things by just having the opportunity sometimes to reflect um, in this manner. Um, it's a unique opportunity, and I always say it's an honor for me whenever I can get to talk to my peers and colleagues um, about some of these issues, learn from each other, um, exchange ideas, and then forge ways forward as to the work we've got to do. Absolutely. Um, so maybe we'll um, start by chatting, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about Empowerment Squared and where the idea came from. Yeah, so um, Empowerment Squared as an organization, I often tell people I didn't, I never had this grand idea in my head. I never even thought I was going to start an organization. I, I studied political science in school um, and took a lot of economic courses as, as I was interested in that. So there was never a direct correlation to this. But when I got to Canada as a government-sponsored refugee, a few things really struck me hard. Um, one of them was just the, I came to terms with the harsh realities that kids in Canada could drop out of school. It did not make sense to me at all um, because where I came from, we will die to try and get to school. And we would stand outside of the classroom through the windows and try and peek in because our parents could not afford our tuition. So we're not allowed in classes, but instead of going home, we would stand to the window to try and see what we could get. So it didn't make sense to me now in a country like Canada where you don't have to directly pay out of pocket that kids were dropping out. So I wanted to understand it. But the, the most important thing for me was I was struck that there was no understanding or focus on how young newcomer Canadians we're, we're navigating the integration journey in Canada. Um, there was there didn't seem to be any focus on it in our immigration system. So that that kind of piqued my interest right away because I came as an unaccompanied minor at the time without my family. I've, I've been living by myself since I was 15 years old on two different refugee camps. So I got here. I did not have that same setup with mom or dad or brothers or sisters, none of that stuff. And none of that stuff had been a reality for me for a long time. Um, so... I found myself in a space where there was nothing I could do with any of the information that was being provided. Um, and I quickly realized that other young people who came with their families as well um, was also were also in the same situation, even though their parents were here, but they felt completely useless with everything that, were, that was going on. And then I realized when we moved out into the communities that the young people actually became super parents because none of the information given to their parents made sense. The young people were the ones who got it first, learned the language, knew school, knew their way around to get the bus, um, could properly navigate downtown. So their parents started to rely on them for very sophisticated decisions, something that no one prepared them for. And that's where Empowerment Square came in. Um, my goal was to really understand how we could empower young newcomers um, to settle and become successful members of our community in Canada. And we quickly narrowed that down to the ability to navigate the education system successfully. It's such an inspiring story there that, I mean, there's so much that we don't see below the surface. I think when you start to, when you start to process different journeys and um, we often talk about how I'm really happy from my perspective, that more people are coming to tables for discussions, right? And more people are like, okay, I'm I'm willing to admit that I don't fully understand that which is beyond me and my own privilege. Um, and I'm willing to open myself up to learning. In the process of that learning is where I think the layers of difference comes in. And I often, you know, like to talk about the equity part of it more than any anything else. It's not about making sure that you've checked a few boxes. It's not even about making sure that you truly are living um, a, a different journeys and and having them as part of your um, your setup. It's it's in that equity piece, isn't it? And with equity, as we talked about earlier, Leo, there is a great deal to be said about addressing the deficits. So dig into that a little bit for our audiences? What, what do we mean when we say that we need to, to fix that deficit? I think it's a conversation many people 
intentionally or unintentionally shy away from uh, because it, it comes with the, with the reality of facing the work that's involved, right? It's easy for me to express sentiments and disgust and anger about something that happened than to commit to doing something about either restoring it or creating something new that will be able to deal with that situation. That's a much more difficult thing to say because now I have to consciously think through what would I have to do? What would I have to commit? What type of resources would it require of me? Um, and am I being honest with myself? Now, I will now have to evaluate all of those consciously compared to say, if I just have to say, wow, that is horrible. That is so bad. That should not be allowed. That should not be accepted in our society. That's easy to say. I don't need to mean any of those words to say it. I don't even need to think about it to say it, right? So I think when we talk about balancing equity, people need to understand, like I've always said, that it's not about just fighting. And don't get me wrong, fighting has a very prominent and important place in the history of, of the fight for equity, and it will continue to, in my opinion. Um, but one thing that we should ask ourselves, why do we see continuously that the same reasons people protested for 25 years ago, we're back in the streets 25 years later protesting for the almost very same reason. You can literally take some of the press releases, erase the date, and replace it with 2023 or 2021, I mean, and you would think that that press release was written yesterday instead of 25 years ago. So I'm at a place to say, let's balance the equation, right? Let's fight with one hand and let's build with one hand. That is really what will help us understand um, dealing with the deficit but at the same time confronting the outcomes of the practice of racism, discrimination, and all of the other things that we talk about, we can confront it with a fight. But to deal with the deficits, we're going to have to build to deal with, with the deficits. And I think that's where the real conversation is. Yeah, um, I think one of the things that, uh, you know, we, we had chatted briefly about, especially in the context of charitable partnerships, is... Um, you know, and you had talked to us a little bit about the the how sometimes in the journey to serving the communities that we want to uplift and we want to support and we want to advocate for, um, there is a risk of sometimes losing our way around who we're serving. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Um, you know, there is a quick, uh, I, I often use, like to call it sometimes knee-jerk reactions, right? Um People live in a particular community for a long time and one researcher goes ahead and does a research and publish some horrific statistics. And people are like, wow, this is, and you see funders clamoring now to say, we want to help, right? And I often say this to organizations, whether you're a BIPOC organization or a non-BIPOC organization, it doesn't even matter to me because it's across the board. You are not supposed to be the servants of funders. You are not supposed to be the representatives of funders. I think that is a, a misunderstanding of the role that you should be playing based on the commitments that you've made to communities and victims of these situations. Instead, I think we should be advocates. And what that means is this, if all we're doing is working hard day and night to meet the requirements of the funders, I wonder who's being left behind. I wonder who's being ignored. I wonder whose voices are not being brought to bear. Because if all we're doing is submitting the report to the funders in accordance with the requirements that we were given, I wonder which part of the report is not making it in the report. If all we are reporting about is the 10 requirements, I wonder all the other things that may have happened that are of significant importance. That when I read reports from nonprofit, I'm often struck how people find it acceptable that everything just went well. They just met all the 10 requirements and it just looked great and it just fits in with the funding requirements. That is not humanly possible. It is not, I care less how great of an organization you are, which staff you've got. It's not humanly possible that you just perfectly met these numbers like this and in isolation of itself and there were no other issues or things. So what is it that is not making it in those reports? I wonder are funders prepared to get the entire report and not just a portion of the 10 requirements? Should they be? So I think organizations need to start asking themselves that what is our role? Why are we the servants? Are we representatives of the funders? Or are we in a position of power 
to be advocates for the same communities that the funders are saying they want to help anyway. What's so bad about hearing the voices of the very people that you really want to help, so dearly want to support? So I think communities, I mean, community organizations, BIPOC or non-BIPOC, should now start to bring to the table the full understanding of the community as it is, even if it directly contradicts what the funders think they want or they're asking for. It is an opportunity of education. I think that's where we are. We should be advocates and educators of funders to help them better understand what is the connection with you and your enormous resources and these communities that are finding a way to deal with the deficits that they've been confronted with. In terms of like key takeaways, like if you're talking directly to to some of these companies, where do you tend to tell them to start looking for the change to this? Because the fact remains that that is the, the main operating sort of system that runs most of it. Um, and bringing that change is, is desirable, but nobody's getting around to it. So where would they start, Leo? There are some few very practical <laughs> I like to be practical. And there are, there are endless lists of things that we can talk about. But I'll start by being practical. Number one, I give an example. Um, when these issues happen and companies or funders say they want to talk to black BIPOC community members, right, to get understanding. So everybody's calling you. Everybody wants you at a table, right? All these tables they're calling you to. However, we know in time past, these very tables, people who came to this table as consultants or whoever, got paid a lot of money to come and do the work they were called to do. Here I am, I get 10 to 20 calls a day from multiple tables, but I'm just supposed to go there and participate and give my great ideas and come back home, right? How come, not because I don't call myself a consultant or put a certain name on me, how come nobody thinks that it is only fair for you to account for the value of that work you're asking of me the same way you would have paid Deloitte? The same way you would have paid any other consultant had you brought him to the table to say, we want to organize three town halls with BIPOC communities. We need you as a consultant to set it up. They will send you a bill. Now, this is where some of the deficit comes in because in our community, people don't see themselves. People have been taught to devalue their knowledge. They've been taught to devalue what they have. So I get 10 different committees in the city calling me to sit on the table because they feel my knowledge or my experience or my expertise would be great in informing this but I'm supposed to do all of this as a volunteer and then have a full-time job at the same time to feed my family and take care of my responsibilities. So one of the things companies and funders can start to do, start to add value to the knowledge and participation and ability of BIPOC community members that you are asking to come and do this difficult and dangerous job. Because let me tell you why it's dangerous. I said the same thing about different police forces that I work with. You call me all the time. So want to work with BIPOC communities. I go to young kids in the Black community to try and help them understand how can they understand that the police is here to protect them and their friends and they should not be afraid of them. And two weeks later, they come back to me that a police officer just carted them downtown. You know what you've done to my reputation? As a BIPOC community member, as a leader in my community, you know what you've just done? I can't go back to that kid. How am I going to go back to that kid and say another thing to them in the same community when I just betrayed them by letting them open up to a police officer who carted them down the street when I told them that the police should not do that? And it's the same thing with companies. You bring BIPOC community members to these tables, there are enormous risk because sometimes the things we tell you, you do not follow it. But when our communities see us at these tables, they assume that those tables are supposed to do the right thing because how would have someone like Leo participated and this outcome is like this, even though if my advice was not taken, right? That's one. Number two, let's get it straight up. Please stop setting your 10 requirements for the funding without the inclusion of the voices of the people you want to serve. Please stop coming to organizations and asking them to do things that are impossible. You come to me and you give me $20,000 to support 50 Black children who are struggling in, in school. And you want the money to be spent for books, for snacks, for bus tickets, great. So who's going to pay the quality of staff that's supposed to be there? Who's going to pay the rent for the building that we're supposed to use? Who's going to pay for the electricity that we're supposed to flip on every day? Who's going to pay for the insurance for the risk involved if something goes wrong? So stop, stop giving people money to pay for, for programs. Start investing in organizations. Because if you like the work that an organization is doing, then don't pay for the programs because the programs are happening in isolation. 
We should be comfortable to say we will fund an organization with $20,000 to support 50 black children. And don't come and do the atomized budget for me, bus tickets, snacks, this. No, because at the end of the year, I still have to produce you a financial report anyway to say how I spend the money. It's okay to put parameters around it that I can spend it for my own luxury, that I can spend it for something else. But you might as well become the ED of the organization then if you're going to just atomize the budget for me down to every penny and every cent. Because that's not how our work evolves. All of a sudden, we bring 50 kids to help them with their schoolwork. And while they were here at school, one of them, we realized that does not have winter jacket. So he might not go to school the entire winter, or he might walk in the cold the entire winter to go to school. Now I have to make a decision to provide a winter jacket for the kid. Oh, I cannot do it because the $20,000 is itemized to the dollar. So I think these are some, I'm using these as institutional examples because funders like to talk about, you know, the high level things that they can do. I am saying to them, you're either going to trust BIPOC communities to work with them. And that doesn't mean it will go well either. Some of them will fail. Some of them may not work, but guess what? That is where the character, the test, that's, that's a real test of our character. Are we committed to the process of building and dealing with the deficits, or are we only committed to picking and choosing the people who we think will meet our expectations? Are we willing to be disappointed and still remain committed to the process and deal with the challenges that made us to not succeed? This week is, is heavy and hopeful all at the same time, I think, for the world, because it's a year since the murder of George Floyd, a year since we all got to watch someone strangle another human being for eight and a half minutes on video. And, you know, while there's been a lot of discussion that's happened over the last year, it brought about aspects of the systemic racism discussion that we've been having to the front and got more people to participate in it. It's um, it's easy to stay silent, isn't it? It's easy to stay silent sometimes saying like, this is all much bigger than me, not directly related to me. So that's kind of part of what we wanted to dig into in today's episode um, and then go into breaking that down into some actions for each of us as individuals and units. So Salsa, would you like to set up our guests? Yes, um, I'm excited to introduce Shahara Downing, um, who's an incredible uh, speaker and the founder of Levelcom. Um, Shahara talks to and trains uh, corporate business leaders to find their voice and speak authentically and intentionally um, towards growing their business and their personal brands. Um, Shahara, welcome to ABC DEI. We're so happy you're here. Yeah, thank you so much, Susan. I really like. What, what did you say? you know, like the hope and what? Uh, heavy, heavy and hopeful. <laughs> heavy and hopeful. Yeah, I think that that is just a, a perfect way to kind of talk about, you know, the culture, the, you know, the, 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 the tone of where we are, you know, with things. It's heavy, but it's hopeful in a weird type of way. So that, that definitely spoke to me. I think one of the one of the things we've talked about is the murder of George Floyd um, certainly has resurrected the Black Lives Matter movement, but over the past year, it has also extended into other planes of discrimination, whether that's the immigrant experience, whether that is the indigenous experience, whether that is the trans experience, it has extended into um, a call for accountability in general for workplaces, for governments, for leaders, um, for schools. And um, I think part of it is this week, I mean, it marks the one year anniversary and I want to kick us off with the Black experience. And I want to chat and, and really get your input on this week is, you know, hopeful and heavy. How do we center the Black employee experience? How do we center the Black constituent experience? How, how do we put the spotlight on the Black experience this week. Systemic racism, you know, shows its ugly and dangerous head in so many different places. Uh, imagine me selling my beautiful home, right, in a beautiful neighborhood, uh, nicely decorated, 
And it is appraised when I have to get it appraised. It's appraised for, let's say, 250000 uh, almost half of what it's worth, right? And then I say, hmm, this is so interesting. So then I go and uh, I, I decide that I'm going to take out everything that signifies that a Black person lives here. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to get my friend, who I care so much about, Karen, to stand in my space. <clears throat> and I don't know if you know, the, when you say Karen in the Black community, you know we're talking about a white lady, but uh, no shade to all the Karens out there, right? Um, <laughs> but, you know, I get Karen to stand in my place and then they do the appraisal and it's offered what it's worth. And that is not a fictitious story that I'm just coming up with to prove a point because I'm scorned. That is factual and it's in the news. Go Google it somewhere. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and it's making headlines. It and that, that's literally what happens. And it's made headlines before where it's a trend for Black homeowners to, and especially if they're not living in a predominantly Black neighborhood, to remove anything that signifies that you're Black. So is that appraisal? Is the person doing the appraisal? Is he racist? No. Is she racist? No, but that is what un- unconscious bias is. And that is the new language of racism. You give grace, you extend niceties, you extend extra favor, you, you, you um, assume the best, you, you're made more comfortable, you know, when you see someone like you. And unfortunately, Black people and people of color know how to straddle that line of setting aside their unconscious bias a bit more effectively than those of white skin. It's just, I think it's just a fact, but you know, my thoughts aren't, you know, uh, case studies. Um, But we, we see that all the time. We see it in, and that's real estate. We see racism in, in the medical field, black women, me, I don't have kids, but this is what I have to think about. I am going to have to get a black doctor, period. I'm going to have to get a black doctor because it has been proven um, that black women who come into hospitals or black people that come into hospitals aren't given the same treatment as um, if if they had a black doctor. When they have a white doctor, is it because the white doctor is racist? Nah, but he may have a couple of uh, preconceived notions that happen subconsciously about what type of pain a Black person can withstand. Mm. And you've seen it. The lady that died, who was a doctor herself due to COVID, and she posted in the video, she died, you know, weeks later, asking for help. Please give me medicine. The same medicine that a white doctor probably would have given to a white patient. Oh, they're in pain. There's a certain type of camaraderie that comes from that white space and it's called white sovereignty. And it's like, it's everywhere. So racism isn't just, you know, we hate you black people. (laughs) We hate you, you know, Indian people. Racism are the the very subtle things that continue to support a, a system that lets these injustices continue to happen without holding anyone accountable. And that's the reason why people were so afraid during the George Floyd case that Derek Chauvin was just going to get off like many others have. Like in the case of Breonna Taylor. Are you really telling me that some of those police officers got more time for the bullets that went through the drywall than the bullets that hit the people? Mm -hmm. How do you explain that? Mm -hmm. Except for, oh, well, those those officers, they're not racist, but the system is, Mm -hmm. you know? So that's what we're dealing with when we're thinking about you know, I, uh, when people talk about the trickle de- the trickle down effect, at least here in the, you know uh, in America, talking about you know economics or whatever, but you know, like the tr- the trickle down effect is also this this big system that trickles trickles down in every facet of life, in real estate, in medicine, in in policing neighborhoods, 
you know, so it's, it's an unfortunate thing that we have to deal with, but I think, you know, as we bring it all the way down to us as individuals, it's like, what do we do? And it shows up in the things that we decide not to pay attention to. And like you said, Rohini, it's, you know, we have to get to a point where, you know, silence is just not enough. We can't, we can't be silent. Yeah, I think, you know, um, and just building on that, I think part of the the insight you've shared that's so interesting is it's not, racism is not a pers- at a personal level because it has now seeped into the system and foundation of everything, right? Healthcare, the where we live, geography, hiring, the kinds of jobs um, that are available to people. And so changing it, requires a systemic shift. But for too long, I find, you know, the I call it the three eyes that come in the way of change. There's either ignorance, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to say. There's um, intention, oh, it wasn't my intention to alienate or to offend. Or when we start talking about racist systems, it becomes indifferent. Well, I, what am I going to do? I can't change politics. I can't change the way our company hires. So you know, it is that that tension, right? It is an individual contribution, but it is also system, whether that's government, whether that's workplace. So how do we move forward and balance both of those responsibilities, collective and, and singular? Um, I, you know what? I, I think that, and I know when we talked about this, it's like, okay, what clear things can we do? You know, um, and, and honestly, I'm talking to my willing white people too, you know, because the, yeah. the people, people of color, you know, are stepping into those spaces. You know, um, we've been holding up the mantle because for some reason, when it comes to this, like you said, it's like this space of ignorance. Oh, well, I don't, I don't know. You know, uh, I think you do. Uh, and, but it's, I think it's a tough thing to face. Um, so I, I would definitely say that it's one just about educating yourself, really looking at the headlines from a different perspective, knowing that your unconscious bias may make you dismiss a headline. Oh, that again. Oh, well, that neighborhood is bad. Oh, well, you know, they're just not, you know, like these are the things, these are the conclusions that we come to. And, and we do it all, all over, you know, like we definitely do it all over. I definitely have, you know, a, a certain conclusions that come to mind when I meet a, you know, uh, a Tom at, at the workplace. I'm going to probably assume he doesn't like black people and I have to try to be nice and be kind and be safe for him to think that I'm, I'm, I'm you know, not a threat. Right. Or to debunk the angry black woman stereotype he may naturally hold (laughs) and I have to and I know I have to go into these situations and intentionally um you know break down the stereotype that he may have but that that's my unconscious bias that I just automatically assume uh that Tom is not woke you know (laughs) so but Tom may already understand um you know what's what's happening with being a black woman in in the workplace and how I'm not afforded you know, certain graces because I'm not part of that, that club. Um, So again, I I think that the main thing is, is if you are, if you see what's happening, don't just bypass these headlines. Don't just, you know, uh, jump to certain conclusions because it is challenging when a man was killed by a police officer, but yet they want to assassinate his character as if it's supposed to justify why his neck was kneeled on Mm -hmm. to his death. You're concentrating though on the fact that what he had a a criminal record or that he, he got pulled over for, or why didn't you just, you know, you know, surrender. It's like, nah, that's not really the issue. The issue is the excessive force. The, the issue is the inequality. And so when you're looking at these headlines, take a moment and just say to yourself, what's right? And if this was a white man, would I be, um, would I dismiss it as I do? If Colin Kaepernick was Tom Brady, 
would you be yelling at him and tell him to get out the country and be happy that you make all this money? No, they'd be calling Tom Brady a patriot. As, as they did for those that stormed the Capitol on January 6th. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's looking at the space of just taking a moment and say, you know what? I'm kind of beside myself in this moment. Let me, let me, put, let me put a white person in this, in this situation and if, if, would I feel differently? And be honest with yourself, you would. Yeah. Um, and I, I feel like sometimes, you know, in the space of like, how can you show up to like my willing white person that's listening to this or people who have been, you know, perhaps a bit uh, desensitized to the headlines, just take a moment and say, if that was my son, it's the compassion that's missing. It's the respect for humanity that's missing. It's the, this dismissive, oh, I can't do anything about it. You can show compassion. And that compassion will feed to your friends when you challenge them and say, no, no, no. That, that death was not deserved. Yeah. So don't, don't, don't bypass these headlines. I think that's one thing I would say. Look at the news differently. Imagine if it was your son. Imagine if Breonna Taylor was your daughter. How outraged you would be that no one's been convicted of her murder. If you like what you're hearing, don't forget to hit subscribe and please drop us a review. If you want to learn more about us or the ABC DEI podcast, visit abcdei.ca.